Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Developing the Leader Within Podcast. I'm Enrique, your host, and today I have a special local guest, Dale Dupree. You know, he's the leader of the Sales Rebellion, and he also is a host of a podcast called Selling Local. Uh, and today I'm just honored because I see I see Dale on LinkedIn. That's what we're connected with most, and I know his work. In, in the sales department, and it is top-notch. So, uh, uh, Dale, just thank you for being with me today, sharing your morning, and sharing this platform as we discuss leadership and sales. You got it, bro. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Well, before we get into the, the meat of the, of the session, let me give you a, a couple of minutes just to tell me a little bit about Dale and, and the sales rebellion and what you guys are doing. Sure. Yeah, my story is is that uh, you know, or, or simple, I should say. It's it's that of the the typical salesperson, which is that most of us didn't go to college. Scott Lee's calls us the trash can of you know of jobs, the sales position, right? Um, and so, and that rings true for me as well too. But really, to understand my my origins, you got to first know that my father um, also was in sales and, and he had ambitions to be an NFL rock star, which led to him blowing out his knees in college and, and ended up putting him on the streets, knocking on doors, selling paper and copy machines. So I like to joke that my dad was the original and the ultimate Dwight Schrute from the office, uh, one of the best paper salesmen to ever walk the earth. And that eventually graduated into the copier world through the organization and, and eventually graduated into being more than just a salesperson, but a legend and, and a community leader as well, too. So, so that's my origins are in you know, the, the, the shadow of the original entrepreneur, the small business owner, right? And, and so we grew up like understanding that business was important, but it was also part of our lifestyle. It wasn't separated there. There sure there are rules that should be adhered to, um, you know, such as, you know, things that, that contrast between personal life and, and business. Uh, but they're not the ones that everybody stereotypes, <laughs> you know, they're, they're things like for my father, they were things like, don't go to a mixer at five o'clock at night and drink, you know, things like that. Like those should not be, those are things that should not be played around with, right? From that perspective. But, but my father wore who he was on his sleeve on a daily basis and taught us to do that as well too. And because of it, he was more than just a copy or salesperson. He was a friend to people, support, you know, mentor, yeah, you know, whatever you wanted to label him. But, but most importantly, he was my dad. And so, in the process of me coming into my own skin, I learned how to sell. I learned the identity of what it looked like to run your own business. I played music instead of going to college. And that ended with me deciding I didn't want to live the rock star life because of the, the 45 minutes that I could go on talking about that, right? And there's there's too much behind the scenes that you have to deal with that I was not interested in. And instead, I came into the copier world, worked for my dad for a couple of years. He sold the business. And then my, my real legend began as I became the copier warrior, personally branded myself with the new organization that bought my father's business and became their number one rep and eventually their VP of sales, taking their, their firm from about 8 million to 25 million a year in revenue in a short amount of time, six years. So, so because of all that, I recognized that I had something going on with the sales game and something a little bit different as well too. And, and so I was empowered by leaders. I was empowered by my mentors, uh, even you know the people that, that were under me that I was the boss over, I was empowered by them. And, and I slowly started to realize my calling, quit my job, started the sales rebellion. And now I'm sitting here on your podcast two years after launching. Uh, that's amazing. Not just the story, uh, you know, of your dad, which is, you know, what's, what's so good about having those uh, figures in our own personal lives is that they stay with us, right? Those memories stay with us. And I'm, I'm sure you're taking those memories on uh, through your progression in the sales environment but it molds you to a greater position. It sounds like you took the platform your dad laid for you and you just ran with it and made it your own. And uh, amazing uh, to take a company from where they were uh, to the heights that they were able to get. And then you solidify with your own little thing. And that's, the, and, and I say little, not in a small a scheme, but you, you know, when we take something as our own and we go forward with it, 
it, it becomes our little thing, right? So, um, and you're doing great things with it. Uh, amazing backdrop uh, uh, story. And I'm so happy that uh, you went uh, after your passion, right? <laughs> Not just your hobby, because, you know, as you're talking about music, I'm a musician too, but it's not paying the bills, right? It's not, that's not what's making the bread and butter, just a hobby, something that we're talented uh, with and, and, and we enjoy. So today we're going to be talking about leadership and sales. I'm excited about having you talk about this, uh, having your, your backdrop and your history, uh, because what I've noticed throughout the time as I am doing leadership development is that leaders don't understand and can't get through their head that part of their job is to sell, right? To sell the thing, whatever it is that you got from your boss, if you're not the ultimate boss, but whatever you got from your boss, now you got to turn around and sell this thing. And sometimes it's a soup sandwich, right? Sometimes it's just a sloppy Joe and you got to make it a eight, you know, course meal. You got to make this thing something that is palatable and the, the, the group can take in and say, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> but, you know, based on the leader's perspective and based on the leader's way forward, we can do this thing and we can do it together. And that's a, that is a miracle in the making when a leader can do that. So um, let's start off with sales in general, right? What, what, what attributes the sales have or components the sales have that leaders should be aware of? So one of the things that I think is, is super important, especially what you were just talking about, is that I, I feel that a lot of people understand the word inspirational, but they they don't necessarily act it out on a daily basis. And something that salespeople have to do is be inspirational. They have to be something different than the other seven vendors and, and an inspirational uh, emotion that can be felt by the buyer is an extremely important one. And as a leader, you've got to do the same thing. But the problem is, is that we try to be inspirational by being the loudest in the room or telling a really cool story. But what we really need to be doing is connecting with the people that we're telling the story to, or, or we need to be inspiring from the place that that person that we're speaking to is in. So meeting them there is one of the core principles of the sales rebellion, meeting people where they are and inspiring in that place instead of trying to pull people away from it. That's, that causes discomfort and typically like despair to an extent because people look at that and say, I could never do that or I don't feel comfortable doing that. And so it's, it's not easy to get somebody out of a place that they are in regards to where you, where, where they find comfort and where you want them to be. So inspiration is one of the most important pieces of the puzzle that we tend to uh, substitute with like arrogance is the best way to, to say it. And I, th I believe that there's a, a healthy amount of arrogance that has to be had in every leader. But at the same time, it's, it's, there has to, that healthy amount is like humility inside of our own arrogance. Like I'm good at this and I know I'm good at this, but at the same time, I know that nobody cares as much as me. <laughs> and so being able to kind of ground yourselves in those moments is important. Every salesperson has to have those attributes. They have to be willing to be able to fall on their sword. They have to be willing to not win the deal because they're not the right fit. And those, those types of, of concepts when played out inside of a leadership role are much more effective than just walking around with an iron fist and ruling over everybody. But also the creative side is extremely important too. You know, I was, I was listening very intently to what you were saying. And those are the two things that kind of popped up in my mind. And so thinking back to my band days from a leadership perspective, that's where my creativity really started. And I had, I was on the road in a, in a tour van with you know, six random guys that I knew, sure, and that we spent a lot of time together. But when you're when you're going city to city every night playing for, you know, thousands of people and then 10 people, there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of emotional triggers. There's a lot of despair that comes in as well, too, to an extent, especially when you're signed to a major record label and you're wondering, like, where's the support? Where's the this? Where's the that? And so there has to be this, this very genuine sense of every day being its own little adventure and having no expectations of the outcomes of the things that are going to happen. However, 
making sure that no matter what, that you're giving people very creative and very unique experiences and all things. So it's not, it's not good enough to just stand on stage and play the song. You have to make the people in the room believe that you don't want to be anywhere else, but on that stage playing that song in that moment for them. And, and those are the things that really transfer that emotion that we're talking about right now from a leadership to, to sales perspective or aspect, I should say, between the two that is very common, that is unused, right? And that if I'm a leader and I'm thinking creatively and I'm thinking about the moment more so than where I want to go with the moment, then I'm meeting people where they are at in that place and time. It's too often, sales leaders say things like, oh, I see, the, I see what's wrong here. I see why or, or leaders in general, I see why this person's not getting the work done. Well, you can see that, sure, but that is assumptive. That doesn't actually give you the answer of what's wrong. Creativity through leadership and this, this ability to be able to connect with people through the experiences that it provides allows people to be a lot more emotionally bought in. And because of that, they'll tell you why they're really not able to, to hit the metrics or meet the goals or do the job instead of what you perceive to be the problem. You know, because what if something's going on at home? What if they have a very dark past around something they, that has been triggered by coming to this, this job, but they don't think they have any other place to go and that they've just got to suck it up and try to beat through it. Those are very dark places for people. And they're very consistent and common. Leaders tend to, to separate like I talked about in my intro, because I knew this was going to come up, they tend to separate personal life from professional walk. And that's horse crap. <laughs> they have to start saying, oh, wait a second, people don't check out of who they naturally are at 8am to come to work and then go back to being who they naturally are at 5pm. They can't like be this robot for me every day. No, they cannot. I'm sorry. It's wonderful that you bring that up. And you know, you, as you're talking, uh, similar to uh, my life, you know, and I, most people know, I tell you what it is. I, I, I'm, I truly am, uh, uh, a proponent and a deliverer of truth. And I find myself in that position, uh, that you just mentioned the trigger of something. And then you, you're in a, a job and, and you're not, you don't know where you are. You don't know where to go. Uh, and so it's important for leaders to recognize that. So thank you for bringing that up. Now, you mentioned inspiration. A lot of people mix up inspiration for many other words, right? Um, but that you can get inspired uh, even in a time of distress and, 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 and a huge amount of stress by a leader to go and uh, not, not suck it up like most people would want you to do. Hey, you know. Uh, yeah, I know it sucks. You, you just got to suck it up for the next several months or whatever, and it'll get better. And then, you know, a year down the road, you're still sucking it up. <laughs> but, but that inspiration that gives hope, that gives a person a something to look forward to, not a mirage, not a falsehood, but something that is truly there, tangible, and you can feel it as you step towards it, can actually motivate and inspire the group to go with you. And that's the true essence of a leader is the ability, ability for you to inspire hope that where you, you are leading them is the promised land, right? It's the, the place that they want to go. Uh, so very, very important. Now, what we find a lot of times in group dynamics and in the leadership relationship with teams is that there's a disconnect from the ultimate goal uh, because the leaders have a certain amount of knowledge uh, that may not be you know, purview for everybody uh, and the actual execution of how to get there. So part of that inspiration is knowing how it applies to the people. And you mentioned meeting them where they are. One of the hardest things leaders can uh, can face on a day to day is not knowing where they are <laughs> and still trying to drive the train a certain road. So what would you suggest for leaders that are finding that gap uh, or are actually experiencing that gap of knowing where their people are versus where you're trying to take them and getting them on board with what you want them to do? Yeah, I think that comes back to this this misconception of 
of expectations versus preference or or even like overexerting expectations. So like telling somebody, these are the things we expect you to do. You know what I really hate is I hate when people put things like, this is a high energy work environment and a job description. I really can't stand that. I think that it it does not necessarily tell people what's actually happening there. And really what it, it spells out is it spells out that you guys want the Wolf of Wall Street to show up and, and make you a millionaire as a leader. It's not, it's not going to drive the right kind of emotion in people, but most people don't like the other side of it is the context. Like some people will read that and be like, Oh, I like high energy. And they'll think this is going to be a great place. And then they show up and it's like, no, no, no. We meant high energy. Like we will literally tell you what to do all day and you will do what we say and you will never stop. Right. Like that's the problem. And, and so I think that there's this, again, there's this assumptiveness and there's these expectations that, that really just caused this type of failure. You know, someone comes in, they're like, man, they just interviewed so well and this and that. Well, your interview questions suck. The discovery of, of who the person is sucks. You know, you've got to really look at much more than just like in that moment, why is there a gap? You have to come back to the foundation of what started this whole relationship. You have to come back to the foundation of that person. Why would they be in this place to begin with? It's not like this job caused them to suddenly hit these problems. It's because of development over the course of their life and where they're at and their walk. And, you know, we hear stories all the time, people like being top producers and, you know, 10 years in, suddenly they're like at the bottom of the totem pole and, and have lost everything because of the burnout, because of things that were existing in their life that nobody asked them about and nobody tried to help them with. And so because of it, they ignored those things. And by ignoring those things, they accentuated them and exaggerated the outcomes around them. And because of that, it led to total and utter failure. So I think, again, it, it is really seriously not about the moment, right? Meeting someone where they are isn't just that minute, that hour, that day. So Tuesday at 11 o'clock when you meet with them in your office, that's not meeting someone where they are. Meeting someone where they are is active listening. It's pursuing an ultimate relationship with somebody more than just, I want to be your, your friend boss, or I want to be able to hear what it is that you want to say to me. But because in their head, they're thinking, because once I have that data and information, I'm going to use it against you, right? It's, it's pure altruistic communication with people without caring about the outcomes and how they affect you. That's true servant leadership as well, too. And that's what love really is. Is it's not a feeling, right? It's not something that we that we that we even act on in some cases. Because if if certain people throughout history were acting out of love, then oh my god, I mean like then like the whole the, really like the whole concept of love has to be changed in those moments. You know, I always think of I, I think of times when I have said I don't want to do this, but I've done it anyway because I know that it affects other people in a positive way, and it, even if it makes me uncomfortable, it makes me, you know, not want to 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 do the thing that I've been doing any longer. Like I, if this is what I have to do, I don't want any part of this. Right? Love is doing the things that are hard, and that comes back to this idea of sitting with someone and meeting where they them where they are. It's not easy for people to do that. It's really difficult because a really highly motivated leader is going to say, I don't understand why you can't get motivated in their head. They're going to say that, right? So being able to step back from that expectation, that assumption and, and meet people in love in those moments and just say, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And the outcome doesn't matter. You could work here. You couldn't work here. We could, we could spend the next six months in turmoil with each other, but if you get what you need out of this relationship and out of this moment, at any point in time in the coming future, then I've done my job as a human being more so than just a manager. Yeah, I'm a, a huge supporter of love in all its aspects, uh, especially at the work site, because you have someone come in to do a job that is leaving behind their family to come to basically, uh, you know, sell out their time, sell out their life. They're selling their life to you uh, for a an exchange, right? But that exchange doesn't have to be just, just all transactional. It could be something that's fulfilling for both parties and where the exchange is actually something that you're happy about uh, and don't have to go back home and say, man, I wish I wasn't working. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's uh, incumbent of, of the leader to be at that level, to be able to uh, share some of that compassion that you feel because of love. Uh, you know, I always go back to uh, my, uh, you know, my religious background where Christ uh, was moved to compassion, right? He was moved 
that was because of the love and 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 that love usually moves you in right directions where it takes everyone into account and not just selfish gain so there are there are attributes of top sales people and let's say let's just talk about a little bit of that because they kind of translate in some ways to the leaders and i mentioned earlier that there's some things that leaders don't incorporate uh, into their day-to-day do, uh, dealings that salespeople have to do, uh, and it will make them a better leader. So let's uh, give me a couple of uh, you know top-notch sales attributes that um, you know just stick out in your mind that could uh, we could bridge them back into leadership. Yeah, first off, Mark twelve thirty one, right? The it's the love your neighbor is as much as you love yourself and that there is no greater commandment. So I I love how you tied that back in because I believe that that's a huge component to success inside of the world today, because we're extremely lost on these, in these topics and use preference and, you know, what some guy or girl said in a TEDx to decide what, how we're going to govern, you know, people when there's 10 of tens of thousands of TEDx's that we could watch in the first place. So that's again, preference or like I connect with this instead of looking at the altruistic form of where, where principles in lie. And so coming to top producers or people in sales that have very good attributes that end up becoming top producers and or leaders and how that, that applies back. I think the number one thing is grit. The number one attribute is grit and the ability to be able to, suffer and without wallowing in it and without dwelling in it as well either just like visiting that loneliness that emptiness that suffering and understanding that it exists and then being able to get out of it and that's that whole concept of perseverance as well too so i think having a perseverant mindset is a massive attribute for for and characteristic for individuals to be able to say all right i'm in a position like with a company that i didn't know i was ever going to be and i'm not really good at this what do i do to get better and instead of saying, is this right for me? I think that ever asking ourselves the question of like, is this right for me is, is crap. It sucks. It's a sucky thought process in general. And I think that all salespeople should denounce it entirely because you are good enough. It might not be the right fit, but that doesn't mean that you suck. And it doesn't mean that it's not the right place to be at this time in this moment. You can learn so much more if you just recognize that, well, I might fail. And that's okay, because I'll learn a lot in this process, but never to tell yourself that you're not good enough. And so that perseverant mindset, I think, is extremely important as well, too. I also think that, that the, the attributes of servant leaders at its raw and real form, right, coming back to, to biblical principles, it would be Jesus, is, is the concept that we've all missed out on, especially as salespeople and as leaders, is that we have created this persona of what a leader is. And a leader is somebody that like, like pushes you or pulls you or, you know, where Jesus was the guy that locked arms with you and said, like, let's do this together. And if we both burn, then we both burn. And, and that's what it is. And I, I, so I think leaders and good salespeople have that attribute of a servant leader, the ability to be able to say with their prospect, for example, it's okay if you don't agree with, my outreach today and that yeah that i and it's okay that if, that that for whatever reason you don't like my my company or my pitch or uh, you know to our decision makers it's okay that you feel that the company this other company that's bidding against me is a better fit for you it's okay it's okay that's fine right but at the same time as 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 i believe that that attitude is, is extremely important I think it's also important for people to have good leaders and good salespeople to have a, an ideology of around what their self worth is and how to incorporate that into their daily walk, into their daily walk. Because a lot of times we, in those moments that I'm talking about as servant leaders that we need to serve first and foremost, that we also get, we just kind of get to this weird place where we, we suffer from like imposter syndrome in those moments. But people that can sit back and say, well, I know my worth and, and yeah, I get that I haven't articulated it properly in this moment that I'm, that, that where I'm losing this deal, where I'm not getting through to my prospect. I know that I'm better than this. And, and, and that ties back to the perseverant mindset and everything else that we just talked about on top of it. So I think the thing is, is that every single little attribute 
that I believe makes a successful leader or a successful salesperson is linked and that they all derive from one another. And so it's not just about like, oh, you got to be good over here at this thing and good over here at that thing. It's that these concepts are very much in line with each other. It's like a process or a system or a checklist that if you miss one thing, the rest of it falls to pieces. And so I think those those core principles that we just discussed that conceptually that people don't just need to be good at them or to, to be people that practice these things, but that they have to live it day in and day out and every single moment and understand that they're not easy to, even if we are good at these things, that they're not always, and when somebody pulls up behind you at a drive-thru and they're honking their horn and there's nothing you can do about it, like you're waiting too. And in your mind, you just, you start thinking all these negative thoughts. When you're driving down the highway and you're in the left-hand lane behind somebody and you're trying to go 80 and they're going 72 in a 70 mile an hour speed, speed zone, you can't, you get frustrated and you get angry. And like, that's not the attitude of a servant leader. That's not the, that's not grit showing up in that moment. That's you being a jerk. Right. And that, and those are things that we kind of default back to as people. Right. And so as a leader or as a sales professional, we have to remember first and foremost at the forefront of all of these concepts that we're human beings and that it's okay that these things aren't always sticking, but that it's extremely important that in every moment we ask ourselves the questions of what's the right thing to do here and not for my own sake and self-glorification, but for the experience of the person on the other side of what I'm about to say or do or how I'm going to pass them on the right. Yeah, no, you mentioned a couple of things that I'm over here chuckling because, you know, first of all, you mentioned if we burn, we burn, right? And I, and and uh, it's so good to have a, a biblical uh, reference in your head um, because, you know, it, it's not so much if we burn, we burn. It says that if the fire comes, you won't smell like smoke. Your clothes ain't going to get burnt. And somebody's going to glorify God after this. So, you know, just taking reference of the three Hebrew boys back in Daniel. But um, it's just it, it's just that type of leader that you need. You need that type of leader that says, hey, fire is going to come. It's inevitable. We live in a world of selfish people. So sooner or later, you're going to run into that person in a, in a drive through <laughs> Sooner or later, you're going to be uh, going 72 in a 70 and then somebody going 80 something, almost 90, trying to get you out the road. So that's going to happen. But when it happens, uh, as a leader, what I'm telling you is that it won't kill us. It will, it's not going to make us worse. It's just going to make us better. And I'll get you there. And that's a, one of the, the attributes you're talking about grit, uh, which I totally agree with. Uh, there has to be some level of that. Um, you know, there is suffering in what we do day to day. And uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes you, you have to know when to say, yeah, it's, that's enough for me. <laughs> let, me let me go on and, and, uh, and bid farewell. Or, hey, this is something that I can press through uh, because I have some people watching me and I got to teach them how to get through this. Uh, so you have to know yourself. You have to know your people, but provide that. Uh, I, I absolutely provide that. Uh, and you know, there's just going to be situations uh, in your interactions with teams as leaders that you, you, and most of the time it's always, you're always just setting the example, but uh, they're, they're looking to you in certain circumstances where they just can't look at anybody else. Because there's sometimes, you know, you as a leader, you don't fit the bill in one area. They usually have somebody else in the group that, you know, can, you know, suffice. Uh, to get them over that hurdle or that bridge. But there's some instances where they need you and they need to see you. And if you don't, uh, you know, pony up or get back, get on that plate to bat up and hit a home run, it could be detrimental to everybody. So when we're talking about detriment, right, because there's every uh, great story, right? There's not, there's, there's not uh, the Academy Award is, is you, you want it, but it came at prices, right? And so those prices also affect the sales teams. Uh, there are some things and some obstacles that sales leaders and leaders in general um, face uh, that could be a detriment to the team. So let's talk about a little bit about the things uh, that salespeople face um, 
that could be a detriment uh, to not only their performance, but the group performance, but also translate to, to leaders? Constantly dealing with rejection. That's the number one issue that, you know, most, most people, even they at the forefront of like getting a sales job, they're told that, you know, like, Hey, you're going to, you're going to get rejected like crazy, but they're, they're told in this way that like feel sarcastic or, you know, a lot of times it's just, it's not in a way that's relatable. Right. And I, I used to do it differently. I, I used to say, do you know what rejection is? And, and then someone would say, yeah, it's this, right. They'd give me an example. And, and like, let's just say that I was dealing with a waiter or a waitress that wanted to get into the B2B space. I would, I interviewed anybody and everybody, by the way, and I was always willing to take a risk on people and, and bet, you know, everything, you know, because I think that humans are amazing, absolutely amazing. And, and I love seeing the kind of the innovation in the American dream, so to speak, like come to life. And, and so I was always out there looking for like the next most hungry human being that I could find. And, and let's just say that, that that waiter or waitress was saying, yeah, you know, I, every day I got to deal with rejection. I got people coming in complaining, telling me they didn't like the service, this, that, and the other. That is a much different rejection than people hanging up on the phone with you or people um, not letting you into their office or not getting you to the person that you need to speak to or finally speaking to that person that makes the decision for your product and service and being told, take me off your list, never call me again. It's a much different rejection. And so the the way that we communicate these issues i think is a huge 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 problem i think that it's one of those things where we we have this discussion where we say what are some of the things that are going to to be the battles that have to be fought and and we we look at the macro of it and we don't look at the micro we don't look at all the all the little pieces of that puzzle you know we forget to ask people certain questions right like i remember uh, my boss hired somebody um to come in and do prospecting with us and and not really run a full sales cycle but just a prospect and one of their methods was going to be door to door and then they were going to be you know essentially a bdr that was door to door and then over the phone setting appointments and they did one day in the field and the next day they quit and they decided that they had no idea they they didn't realize how much they were going to be putting people off when they walked in the front door right and and, that, and again like you could sit there with with my boss and he he would say i told her that she's going to get rejected and that this wasn't going to be easy well that's not the point like she sees the rejection differently than the way that we describe it so the problem with this though is that some people just they just accept it they go oh well, this is just the way it is and because of that they don't they try to battle through it battle throwing it can be one of the most difficult things that we go through because it can spark up all these small micros in our lives and it can cause anxiety it can cause depression it can cause us to, to visit places that we typically wouldn't it can cause us to lean into things like substance abuse or just addiction in general even if we've never suffered from those things just to make us feel different you know because of the constant wear and tear of what happens when you're out in the field when you're or out running, you know, a buck as a salesperson. And so really, I think that rejection is the number one piece of the puzzle. And so a leader, leader, especially like if a leader's ideas are rejected, that can cause them to feel like, well, why? Like I'm in charge and why do people disagree with this? And so I, again, I think just like all the other subjects that we've talked about, it all comes back to this perspective of expectations. And, you know, like it's one thing to lead on principle, and say, well, it's not so much that my idea is based in preference, but it's based and rooted in principle, as opposed to, well, this is just how I like it. This is how I like it. You'll get over it, right? And that forcefulness as well, too, causes rejection for the party that the leader is talking to just the same. So it's to me, it's just this constant whirlwind of rejection, and we label it different things, right? Because it's easier to do it that way. And, and we forget that at our core as humans, we live to appease to an extent, right? And and some of us are hermits and just don't want to ever talk to people, period, right? But for the most part, people like human interaction. They like to communicate with others. They they enjoy the process of sales because it gives them the opportunity to fellowship. They They enjoy being a leader over a team of 50 because it gives them the opportunity to help others grow and to become better. But because, again, we're leading with so many expectations in these moments, these, these side alleys and side streets, I should say, 
they they pop in every once in a while when we're on that road together and we're not ready for them and and because of that or, or and or because we 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 believe that we can get past them right instead of embracing the suck and recognizing that it will not go away and it does not go away um, by any means it will always be something that's in existence and because we don't think that way and we and again we try to just force a round peg into a square hole we end up just screwing it all up for everybody so you know it's a this one's a deep one that you can have a really long conversation just about rejection at that if you ask me but but you know i i feel like that's probably one of the most important things for leaders to be on the lookout for in their daily walk and grind i agree you know that i've been looking at uh in on the side uh, developing a course um there was a a video that i saw and it was all all around the acronym uh, shuva right uh, what people need what what are people really needing uh, and they kind of captioned in with with those letters uh you know uh, the need to be seen heard uh, understood validated valued uh and accepted you know they, these are these are simple things that um people have expectations of right i i expect that if i speak that at least i'm listened to um you may not like it or understand where i'm hopefully i'm i'm you know bringing it up in a way that is understandable uh and people can say oh, okay I, I i see where you're coming from or i understand where you come from but there's a deep there, there are basic needs that people have um but those expectations that you talk about kind of pushes that away because you already have in your head what you want to see. And so, you know, you're just talking about that. You're not taking into account, you know, the, the points that you made earlier, uh, where people are, you know, where are they? Not just like right now, but where are they based on all the history and where they uh, made up and, and how they gotten to this point, where are they? Uh, and, those expectations uh, are uh, can be pretty uh, detrimental uh, if you're not careful. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, this specific topic uh, of, you know, rejection, uh, rejection at any level, whether you're in sales or you're just a leader in a company or you're just management or you're just a worker, you just come in and, and you're trying to do your job and you're getting rejected. It's one of those blows that, uh, that goes beyond the moment into your psyche, into your heart, into your, phys your, your physical can get altered, uh, you know, by stress if rejection is at the level that will cause some type of, you know, mental harm or emotional harm. Your feelings are so hurt that now, you know, you're getting this pain in your chest. You're like, man, that really hurt. Um, and truly is one of the things that will, um, you know, derail your, your, especially if you're in a leadership position, you're constantly rejecting your people. Um, uh, and especially if it's something that you got rejected, so now you're rejecting others. Um, it's one of those things that could be detrimental. So, uh, you know, as we, as we covered a, a myriad of steps for leaders and sales and things that are good and things that are bad, um, tell us a little bit about uh, where the sales rebellion is, where you're taking it, um, uh, and and how could people contact you if they want, you know, to learn about sales and leadership and sales and and things of that nature. Yeah, the rebellion is more. We we are labeled as a sales training and development organization, but we're much more than that. We're a movement, and we believe that our our total success is dependent on on the community more so than it is the leaders inside of our organization and the people that that are directly supporting us and being paid by us we and even they believe the same thing as well too that it is the people that are in our community that are a part of our movement that are pushing the needle, needle forward for the evolution of what sales needs to become no more talk no more fluff it's time for action and and we're leading the charge around it we're we're asking people to do hard things we're asking people to get out of their comfort zones and take risks, and we're doing it in the name of servant leadership and getting back to an altruistic place inside of the sales world where 
you know, the buyer and the seller meet on mutually beneficial grounds, real mutually beneficial grounds, not give and take. And okay, I'll trust you on this one and getting screwed. But this real identity of being able to, to come together and to create something naturally with one another. So we believe in the rebellion that people are, are living out and about. We have a system that we sell called the Rebel Way that we coach on or that you can buy curriculum through and do yourself. But we also believe that even the smallest rebellion that, that doesn't necessarily do everything step by self, step that we ask is, is still a very important one in, in regards to leading the next generations into something much greater than what it is that we're all experiencing, because that's what it's about. We're on this earth for a very short window. And when we leave, we better leave a legacy. And so we exist to tear down the castles of the old guard, of the sales world, and build a kingdom with those who risk and are willing to risk and change the game alongside us. Now you can just Google Dale Dupree and find a ton of resources around me inside of the Sales Rebellion, or you can go to thesalesrebellion.com. You can join our, our free Slack group under the community page. You can listen to our podcast. You can dive into our sales blog, come to our free webinars monthly, whatever. Just come hang out with us and, and, and come be a rebel. But the, the place where you want to go if you, if you like to consume content is LinkedIn, linkedin.com backslash IM backslash copier warrior. And if you like other content, I happen to be on every single platform um, except for the dating sites. So TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and it's all at sales rebellion or backslash sales rebellion to find us. Outstanding. And, and Dale, I, I, yeah, I know you're in all of those things. I follow you in most of all those things, but uh, I'll make sure to have that information as part of the video show notes so that they can get in touch with you. Uh, Dale, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. I know I said about 30 minutes, we've been going over 45, but uh, it's one of those things. Sales is just so, so vast, especially if you throw leadership into it. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your morning with us. Uh, folks, uh, reach out to Dale, go look at his content. Uh, and, you know, somebody asked me, you say, hey, Enrique, you don't mention this. So I'm just going to mention it now. If you like the podcast, if you like the information around leadership, go ahead and subscribe, you know, press that bell so you can get notified on your next episode when it comes up. And I appreciate you guys support Dale. Thank you. Be blessed, brother. And I wish you and the Sail Rebellion all the success in the world. And uh, we thank you for your time.